If you are an independent musician who wants to know what goes into building a career in the 21st century, well, today's episode is for you. Let's jump in. Welcome to episode one of Behind the Band, where we help you grow your music career by talking with awesome artists and people from the industry. My name is David Ryan Olson, if we haven't met. I'm from Evergreen Records, where we're all about helping artists grow. And I'm honored that you've decided to join me today. But before we jump in, just want to give you a little bit of an introduction to what this podcast is all about. So as a musician, and more specifically as an artist, you know that there's a lot that goes behind the scenes. It's more than just what you see on stage or on Spotify or on social media. There's a lot of business and mindset and philosophy that has to back up the the creative side of what you do. So it's my goal here on this podcast to give you just a little bit of a window into all of that by talking with artists, managers, and people who have just been in the trenches of the music industry for a long time. Maybe you're an established artist trying to turn your hobby into something that's a little bit more serious or even just thinking about launching some sort of official music project. Either way, I hope that hearing these perspectives and stories from other people on this show is going to help you learn and be inspired just knowing that there's other people out there in the same boat as you. So if that sounds interesting, would you just be willing to hit subscribe in the podcast app? We have a lot more episodes in the pipeline and just want to make sure you're in the loop for some of the really awesome conversations we have coming up. So let's go ahead and jump in for what we have today. We have a really great guy named Bo Bascoro on today. I really like this guy. He's got a great heart. He's super, super fun. And also, you know, I really like his music. So I'm real stoked that he agreed to be our first guest. And our conversation today is all about what it's like being an independent artist in the 21st century. And more importantly, in the era of social media, Probably like you are, Bo is rocking it without a label. Doesn't have a manager or any other gatekeepers that he has to clear his stuff through. He's driven just purely by his own creativity and willingness to kill some sacred cows when it comes to promoting his music. So we've got a real fun and personal conversation for you. So I'm excited to jump in. So without further ado, my conversation with the one and only Bo Bascor. All right, Bo. Thank you for joining me today. Thank How are you, you doing, dude? Thank you for having me, David. I'm well. I got my LaCroix. I got my uh, ginger beer. Yeah. And I'm happy. <laughs> now, I think that's a pomplamoose, right? A pomplamoose? Pomplamoose LaCroix? It's a... Uh, what? No, it's innocent... Po- oh, it is pomplamoose. I've never even heard of that before. Do you have a favorite LaCroix? I don't. Honestly, okay, so I used to hate uh, sparkling soda in, or sparkling water in general. Yeah. Because I hate the carbonation, but then when I moved down to California, the water was so bad there that, um, and I worked at Cheesecake Factory at the time too, the water was so bad that I had to subject myself to soda water and it was the worst at first, but now it's like, this is like an, it's like, it's like a artificially high, like artificially telling your body that you're hydrated. Mm -hmm. And ever since then, I've been like, all right, I'm in. Dang it. That is not what this podcast is about, (laughs) but that's my (laughs) two to 10 cents about it. So actually, that's a great opportunity. Why don't you introduce yourself? What's your, tell, tell us a little bit about your story. Okay. So a little bit about myself. I am, I grew up in Oregon all my life and I've been, uh, I've been writing music and writing songs for the last few years. And I love comics video games, and old cartoons. That's like a, that's a good, that's a good bio. That's actually a really good bio. <laughs> tell us the, tell us the story of how you first found music as a love. I think it started when I started seeing that, um, all the attractive people liked musicians <laughs> <laughs> and I, I wanted to be, I wanted to be a musician for that reason. Mm. I bet you somewhere in my subconscious, that's actually probably what it is too. Part of it at least. Yeah. Do Let's you know be what, honest with ourselves. Do you know what your uh, Enneagram type is? No. Oh my God. I can't believe you just... I'm, I'm I, just curious. No, no, no. I respect it. And I'm, I'm just... It's funny that you just said that because I've been talking about the Enneagram all weekend really? with different people because I I agree with the Enneagram and and I, I respect people that, that are interested in it, but I think that it's used for the wrong reasons. And so I'm like, oh, it's just... For me, it, it just sounds like it sounds like Christian astrology. Which it is. 
But, but, but even Christian astrology can be useful. Yeah, I agree. But I and I think the point was it f- was for it to be useful. But I think that people are making it e- useful for the wrong. Yeah. Re- for the reason it wasn't supposed to be used. But that's for the other podcast I'm going to be in later this week. <laughs> anyways i grew up such a dork and such a loner in school well you still are (laughs) right (laughs) so when i went home all i wanted to do was either play video games cry or read a comic and um so like i i really was i was like really insecure and well actually that's not true i was very confident in myself but there got to a point where i was i was just like really bullied and beat up and i was like coming home crying and like begging my mom to let me be homeschooled because i couldn't handle how much i was getting picked on and um i grew up in the church and my my church friends and my mom uh my my church friends and my mom's church friends were all kind of kind of manipulative and kind of just like really Mm really cruel to us because we, I grew up in a, um, I grew up in a house that was just me, my sister and my mom. And my mom brings us to a church and she's trying to look like she doesn't come from a single parent home because people are really, people were really criticizing her for that. Right. So there was like, there was a lot of pressure on me. And so I was just like really insecure. And so the only thing that I had uh, at some point was just like playing video games and reading comics because the, and watching cartoons because those were kind of like the only, those were the relationships that I was building (laughs) were these characters. And so, uh, I remember the first thing that got me into music was, um, do you ever play Nintendo 64? A little bit. I never had one. You know Donkey Kong though. Oh yeah. You know Donkey Kong 64? Not specifically. So Donkey Kong 64, you had Donkey Kong, Diddy Kong. (laughs) Diddy Kong? (laughs) Diddy Kong, the little guy. (laughs) You know, okay. Diddy Kong, Dixie Kong, Chunky Kong, and Lanky Kong. And Lanky Kong was my favorite character. And his weapon, everyone had a musical instrument weapon. Donkey Kong's was the congas. Mm. Uh, Diddy Kong was the electric guitar. And Lanky Kong was a trombone. And it was so lit, dude. So basically what would happen was he would play the trombone and he'd be like, this is complete with hand motions, everybody. Literally. Like, no, I wish you I'm could see the trombone. this. And then he goes, and then everything explodes. And I'm like, yo, what? That's the best. So that like, was the first time I was exposed to music the way that I was. And <laughs> when in fifth grade, when middle school, came, the, the, the middle schoolers came, they showed us their instruments and they were like, there's the saxophone, the trumpet. And then there was the trombone and they were like giving demonstrations. I'm like, that's the instrument that Lanky Kong played. I need to figure that out. So I ran up to that guy and I was like, the guy that was playing it, and he, I was like, hey, can you play this? And I go, <laughs> and the guy's like, I don't know what you're even singing. And I'm like, oh my God, he doesn't get it. I need to get this instrument, and I need to learn this part. <laughs> so I spent my entire school career playing trombone to learn the Linky Kong riff. And that was the first exposure to music that made me want to start playing music. Really? Yes. Wow. Yes. That was the first. (laughs) There's like, there's many other, that was playing music. Uh, Composing, which was like actually what I went to college for. um, I, I went to school for orchestral composition. Really? Or music composition. Okay. I say orchestral because like, that's what I wanted to write. And what got me into that was a did you ever play playstation no dude i didn't have game consoles growing up. oh my i i finessed my mom into getting me game consoles and so i got playstation i got a playstation one and i played final fantasy 7 and that was the greatest game of all time and the greatest soundtrack of all time and that music was so good and so there was like a final and like a credit scene or cut scene and there was a piece being played and I was like, oh gosh, this is beautiful. I kind of want to see if I could do something like that. So I learned how to 
uh, I learned my theory and I started writing um, to because I wanted to write something like this video game. So that's what got me into composition. So, And how old were you at the time? I was 12. And then songwriting, which is like really what my passion is now, that I got into that. I know I'm, I'm so long-winded, but I got into that because of... Did you have a TV? Tell me you had at least a TV. You're an American. Yes, I have okay. a TV. <laughs> um, <laughs> so there was this show called Smallville. Okay. Tell Which me, I've heard of David, it. Oh I have my heard God. of it. So it's the, it's the story of like I've teenage... Seen, I've seen Arthur. Okay. Oh, freaking... <laughs> David Olson. <laughs> Smallville is the story of the young Clark Kent learning how to use his powers and becoming Superman. Oh, okay, okay. That and makes a lot of sense. So I... <laughs> season seven, episode five. I'm obsessed with the show. There is a scene where uh, Chloe and Jimmy are about to break up. During the breakup, um, the song Where I Stood by Missy Higgins was playing. And I was like, holy crap, this is so sad. I think I want to make people sad. <laughs> <laughs> and that was that was the kickoff to the the music writing career. Wow. The songwriting career. Yeah. That's so true because like I think a lot of us when we grow up and we're first starting like we've got like the musical training wheels mm -hmm. sort of a thing. We get into it because we felt something for some reason. Yeah. Like whether you're in middle school and you you I heard some emo band. Yeah. It's like, oh, this gets my soul. It just connects. He gets me. Yeah. My chemical romance. So you're at the point where you're like, oh, I want to make people feel sad. Yeah. What happened? I, how, how did you, like, what How what I make steps? people sad? Yeah, I started how, cheating on people. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Oh, okay. That does make people sad. <laughs> Turns out. No, I'm kidding. I What I started doing was listening to a lot of Civil Wars. No, I, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I Dude, think we've we've all. Done I think that. it was. I think it was a uh, dashboard confessional Dude. that got me into it. Freaking dashboard Dude. confessional was like what got me into the uh, like the emo songwriting. And at that point, I wasn't really writing anything because I didn't know how to play guitar. All I played was a trombone, and I think a little bit of the bass. There wasn't really like any. I don't, I don't know. I don't, I, I just didn't know how to do any of that. And so then at that point, I don't really know. I don't really know what I started doing. I think I just started writing songs about my, uh, the girls that broke up with me or no, I bet you, I bet you as a, as a teenager, I probably started copying the artists that I listened to. Cause I'm like, Oh, this feels really good. I want to write something like this. Cause it made me feel good or it made me feel a certain way, whatever it was. And so I probably started like writing like them and same chord progression, but like chord you progression. slightly tweak the melody and your exactly. friends are like, dude, that's the same song. And you're like, no, it's not. S Screw you. Different melody, same lyrics. They're like, this is the same. I'm like, no, it's not. It's a yeah. different melody. <laughs> but or no, we, we switched these two chords. Exactly. Or, exactly. Okay. It's the same progression, but it's in a different key. I don't really think I, I really did anything after that. I think I just like, the thing was, I was so in need of attention back then and needing like people to like me that I, I really, I just played trombone and then made like all of my time was given to anyone that would like give me attention and video games. And I think that was the biggest thing. And I, I kind of like really beat myself up over this last decade because I, I really honestly don't believe that I, I believe that I would have gone, I would have been somewhere else a lot sooner if I just had been more happy being who I was mm. and making decisions for myself rather than for other people. And I think the last, <clears throat> the last decade had been trying to be someone else for someone else and something else. And it wasn't until I moved to California and started like isolating myself to really get myself back in, in line, did I really start taking it seriously? Which was about, what, 2014, I think. Yeah. Well, well, go ahead and, and fill in the gaps in the story a little bit. You're growing up, you're, you're starting to dabble in songwriting. Mm -hmm. um, at some point, you end up in California. Mm -hmm. 
tell us about that journey that led you yeah. to to that move. What because and, and you, you implied that that move to California was you know to pursue music in some capacity, right? I realized that the last few years. I mean, growing up, I had been making so many decisions because of you know like a girl who when i got offered a an incredible opportunity to do music f- uh, you know to sing on like a cru- oh so i was going to sing on a cruise for i think i mean it was you've been on one of those so it pays a crap ton and well this one did at least um and when that happened she said it's either me or the cruise. I don't care that it's only six months. I'm not going to do long distance relationship for six months. Wow. So you either move up with me to Seattle and go to school or you take this cruise and you say goodbye to me. And at that point I was like, I am so lonely and insecure and I don't want to lose what I have with this person. So I'm going to go up to school with her. Mm-hmm. And that was, I, people always say, I try not to regret it, regret anything, but that Holy crap, I will always kick myself over that because basically when I went up to school, I was there for a few months and then found out that the American Education Services made a mistake on my credit, gave me bad credit instead of no credit. So I couldn't keep receiving loans. So I Mm. couldn't keep going to school. So I had to drop out and go $60,000 into debt because of that. Because I was so insecure. Really, I was so insecure that I wanted to follow someone that didn't believe in me and didn't want to uh, encourage me to follow my my passions yeah. and force me to follow hers. Yeah, And that is a really, I kick myself over that because that that's on me. And, and after that point, I was like, there is, that's never going to happen again. So if that, if I'm ever put in that position where I'm in a relationship with someone or with anybody that says it's either me or your dreams or your passions, I, I, I can't, I'm going to go, I'm going to choose the passion. I'm going to choose me over that because that is, I, first of all, I just think that's really manipulative, but like that's robbing yourself of something and sacrificing yourself for someone else without them having to sacrifice anything. And I think that's a really crummy move. And so that happened. And, and honestly, for almost the whole decade, I'd been, doing the same thing, which really, not necessarily, but like, like I have been insecure and have had bad, unhealthy relationships because I need to feel, I've needed to feel valid, validated or important to someone. And so I'll sacrifice my finances, my time, my opportunities for someone. And so finally I got to a point where I was like, this is not right. I'm making, I'm spending so much time feeling good about my relationships, but I have so many relationships with people that like friends and everything. And like my friends were all like, oh, I know what it takes to make it. And like, all we have to do is this, this X, Y, and Z, and that's it. And we'll be, we'll be millionaires and we'll be in a screamo band in front of hundreds of thousands of people, which I haven't heard ever happen, but (laughs) I really encourage that person to pursue that still. But Yeah. yeah, but then what they would do is go to the bar drink, waste their time, and then go play video games. And I don't discourage video games or social socializing, but that's all they did day after the day. So I was like, I need to get out of this and I need to really make up for lost time. So I went to California. Um, I met uh, my now mentor, he was then too, but my mentor, Denny White, who... He's worked with a million people, Greg Holden and The Fray, Christina Perry, Tiesto, and wow. just like a ton of people. And uh, he's uh, one of the, the um, artists for um, Golden Coast. And he um, he took me under his wing and he he taught me how to record, how to, he gave me encouraging, um, or he gave me encouragement with like, what kind of things to consider as a songwriter, how to write. Basically, he always said, say the same thing, but differently. He taught me how to work on um, a digital audio workstation, DA, and um, he taught me all that. So when I wasn't working, I was either 
with him chatting and just kind of like digesting what the knowledge he was giving me or I was at home in the corner of my room working on whatever song, learning how to write a song or learning how to record myself. And that was for a few years. And um, yeah, I just didn't, I didn't have any kind of social life. I woke up, gym, come home, write, go to work, come home, write, go to bed, rinse and repeat. Mm. So, um, so yeah, so that, that was my California, that was basically like the whole California experience. It was crazy because I actually, I was really stable with money at that time. Mm. And a lot of times when people leave, I, I noticed that a lot of times when people leave their homes, they get, uh, they get, I don't know whatever ends up happening, but then they end up coming back home or getting stuck at home. Whereas I had the opposite where I left and I wanted to come home and, but I couldn't because I was so stable here and I didn't have any st- stability in Oregon. But then it was like, I need to go home because I, I started developing or getting deeper into some mental illness stuff. And, um, and it's just like, I think a lot of that came from like being isolated and being once a like major extrovert and all of a sudden just losing my mind over all these like small things and stuff. It was, it was a wild trip. What do you think your time in California in terms of like your own personal and musical growth, what was kind of a big takeaway of that, that season of your life? It was a really pivotal moment for me. It was a milestone because I learned a lot. I learned how to be alone because I couldn't be alone before, mm. which I don't think either is wrong. Right. But I was really majorly like needing attention and needing people. And at this point, I couldn't do anything by myself. So I was reaching out to so many people asking for help or attention. I learned how to be okay being honest with my not okayness. Mm. I I noticed I was just becoming more honest with myself and I started getting falling deeper into my depression and my uh if you haven't noticed already on the on the, on the recording my Tourette's and like a lot of things were you know my stress, my anxiety and um and I had to cover it all up and mask it cuz I was raised to pretend that everything was okay because my mom who was a single mom said she wanted to she had a lot of pressure raising us pretending that she wasn't a single mom and that um i think that really rubbed off on me where you you have to pretend everything's okay so i got to a point where i realized i'm not okay and it's okay not to be okay and you can find people that can accept you for both. Right. And so that was, I think that as far as mentally or like personally, that was the biggest, I think that was the biggest, um, most effective thing for me. Sure. Personally, as far as music has gone and just my, any career I want to ever pursue in general, I think the biggest thing that it taught, helped me was thinking in my own creativity rather than someone else's. And, Um, just like my work ethic has changed so much and the more I can do myself, I just thought the more I can do it myself, the, the more efficient everything is. And the more I'm the, I'm the creative that I want to be, the, the more of a favor I'm doing to the world because there's only one Bo Bascoro and the world needs that one person, you know, that one individual, more than a copy of another individual. And I think you're robbing the world of that when you are trying to imitate someone else. Totally, totally. And that's why I think, like everyone, like I said, everyone says this, says and feels the same way at one point or another in, in the music industry and acting industry and in any creative industry, the goal is to say the same thing, but differently. And I try to, tell myself every time I'm I'm in the studio or every time I'm trying to be creative. So those are my those are my take homes, my yeah. literal take homes. <laughs> so you touched on something about what you learned about yourself in your time in California. And it's it's to be authentically you mm-hmm. as an artist and as a person. Right. And I think that's really interesting that you bring that up because that kind of gets at the core of what being an artist and being a musician is is all about is mm-hmm. figuring out a way to express what you feel on the inside <laughs> yeah. in a way that hopefully will connect with other people. Yeah. Um, 
And that's interesting because there's also this pull, I think, especially in the social media age, to give off the impression of success and that you've made it. Yeah, the whole and fake it till you make it and look better than you are. Totally. Mm-hmm. Um, what would you have to say about that? Because that sounds like that's something that you've wrestled I, with. Is- I do wrestle with it still because everyone wants to flex on everyone because everyone wants to look like they're important. And everybody knows that social media is is so artificial and like everyone, I want to look like I'm a successful musician and model and actor. And so I post crap on my Instagram that is almost, now that I look back, I sometimes cringe because I'm like, I'm so robotic. And it's just like, if people know me, then they'd know that I don't smile this much. Or if people knew me, they know that I am so broke and I can't afford to be in the studio right now, but I really want to do this. And like, it's funny, if you go very to the very beginning of my Instagram, it's like this random, that my first picture is a picture of my old friend Jeremy and we're going to a He Is We concert and it's just her face and who cares? And there's no caption or anything. Up until I think... I went to California where like, I'm going away and everyone's seeing me off and like, they just want to know how I'm doing. He's going to pursue music, which like my pursuing music was really just to learn how to do, how to write music and come back home to, to pursue it. Right. Um, right. But while I was there, I was like, every, everyone saw me as a mystery cause they didn't know. And so all of a sudden I started like posting very little and I'm trying to be as mysterious and like mysterious as possible. And I don't know. I just wanted to be seen like a rock star because people yeah. saw me that way. And I wanted to post stuff like that. And I wanted to look like I was a big deal. And then when I came back, it was kind of like, it's not that big of a deal. But then I started taking music seriously and I was like, Oh, this is a great platform to promote myself. So I started promoting my music and all of a sudden my, my Instagram page was just, a uh, an ads page and the intention of Instagram was just to see people's lives. And I mean, it was just another social media outlet. So it was just to be engaging with other people. And now I'm using it as a way to mask all my failures and my relationships and my, my family and my finances and tell everyone everything's fine and I'm doing well. And like, I mean, I still, people still do it. And I don't think it's wrong. I don't think that, posting about whatever opportunities and whatever you want, do whatever you want. That's fine. But I am realizing that as an artist, I think that people, your audience is attracted to you when you aren't on your, your pedestal, but you're in the trenches with them. Right. And when you can say, I, I mean, don't, don't like, I don't know, don't marinate in this or saturate it with this. But like when you, when you can tell people I'm not okay, you know, and you can be honest about wherever you are in life and post some stupid, ugly picture rather than just always these immaculate photos. When you can be honest and also share your successes too, when you can share both, I feel like that's what your listeners and your audience wants because your audience loves your music but your audience also loves you. And right. I, I mean, I hope so. Your fans do at least. And I mean, it's subject, it is subjective to different fan bases and stuff, but you know, definitely it's, it's in the same world of look the part, dress the part you want to look, but also dress the part you want to look, but also, you know, have, be real with them. I want people to see that I do these things and I pursue these things, but also I don't want to hide that I'm not always the successful because I'm not and I'm not always you know smiling which I mean I already write that in my music in the first place so why not use this as another outlet right totally so tell us a little bit about what you're doing now yeah. musically I really started working in music in 2017 that's like when everything really launched my first release was with a collaboration with uh, a company called Maxwell House Coffee and after that, that like was the opportunity to give me the boost into, um, into the music industry and kind of get my, my, uh, my foot in the door. And so after that, I kind of gained momentum and I just, I, I needed to start 
throwing stuff out into the world. And so um, I made this goal of releasing a song per season. I released a single. My first single was Mercy. I released that in the summer of 18. Then I released a single in the fall and then in the winter and then spring of 19. And that was kind of like a milestone for me because that kind of like just taught, that just showed me that I could do it and kind of build some momentum. Now that I have content though, this year is kind of like, how do we take bigger steps into really getting, building the following, building the fan base and uh, I guess raising ears. Cause I have like, I have a decent, I feel like I have a decent, uh, online presence, considering I I do every literally everything myself. Yeah. So there's not really there's no team of um, publicity team. There's no marketing team. There's no management. So it's just been me and my creative team, which I freaking love them. Have to I I just love them to death. I would do anything for any of them because they the way they've supported me and yeah. and helped me with their creativity and everything that you see of, of me on the internet is that that is good is from (laughs) it's from it's from this this squad and so many times people like you think you'll ever move back to LA I'm like why would I want to move back to LA when I got this team and actually this year if before I I left the country for a little bit I just got back but like before I left I was thinking man I'm not gonna have a house when I get home I'm not I'm not gonna have a home um maybe this is like a sign that I should move back down to California but then I was like Today, actually, I decided there's no point in moving away from the resources that I have when I have people here that that believe in me enough to help me pursue my passion just as much as I want to help them pursue theirs. Right. Music is so universal and so accessible now. You don't need to be in the heart of of a music capital in order to be noticed. Oh, freaking Billie Eilish. She's a perfect example. She was on SoundCloud, made some dope songs, and now she's just the the next team pop star. And so, right. So now the, the the plan is, how do we take the next step? So how do we? We made this many followers. We got this many streams. Whatever we made this content. How do we take it to the next level? Yeah. How do we get the publicity? How do we get the the movie trailer we always wanted to be in or, you know, how do we get our designs seen more? And so the last song we tracked was in the fall. Uh, we shot a, a video for it and we're like trying to get as much content as we want out, but we're polishing it in a way that like, it's just done differently than the last releases. This one's kind of slow, but I think it's slow for a reason. Like I think it's, we're going slow so we can understand what the process looks like and what moves we need to make. Uh, in order to to launch those the right way, fast and efficient. So this one's kind of like we're kind of um, nursing this one until um, un- until we got all the pieces together. Literally, for me, I'm on my own, so I'm on my computer every night trying to figure out like who am I supposed to talk to? What am, what am I supposed to do as an independent? I don't have a manager, so as a 100% independent person, mm-hmm. like stats aren't everything, but you have some pretty impressive stats. That's 100%. <laughs> uh, I mean, like, hi, keep up on Spotify, 1.2 million streams. Uh, <laughs> the Woman, half a million streams. The Color Blue, uh, 238,000 streams. Wow. Uh, I mean, like, I could keep going on. You're like, what? but those are the only songs you ever Yeah, those released. are those <laughs> are literally the only, no, he has, he has many, many more songs that are fantastic. Oh, man. Um, give us a little bit of insight on to how you even got to that point because I know there are so many artists out there that are at the point where it's like, you know, they they have a huge, really loyal following of yeah. like, you know, maybe the friends that they grew up with or yeah. went to college with uh, sitting at two, 3,000 streams on a song. And that's a huge win for them. Yeah. But, you know, looking, how do you how do you start like leveling up in the next direction? I, I got so freaking lucky. The Woman was the first song I ever really released. Mm. and it landed a playlist immediately. Okay. How, what was the story of that happening? Wh- Honestly, because every every artist that I've talked to has wanted their first release to land on a playlist. That never happens. Honestly, yeah. that never happens, and it's stupid that it happened to me because I don't understand it, but... Honestly, I want to say I did this strategy, and this is what I did, but I, I threw it onto CD Baby and said... This is an alternative rock song. 
and then threw it out into the world. And, and that's, and then I found out that it was on a playlist. So, which I always feel kind of like, <laughs> I wish I had a better story for that. Did you submit it to anything? No, or I didn't it? even know you could submit. I always feel bad about this because like I've had so many people come up to me and say like, hey, can we get, can we go to coffee? Let me pick your brain about this. And then they're like, so how do you get on a playlist? And I'm like, I mean, my answer is a little different now because I, <laughs> I think I know a little bit more. I just said, honestly, I don't know. It just happened. I wrote a song and someone liked it. That is never the case. And that would never happen to me in a million years after that one year. But that that was a very unique case that happened. And the other songs that have been on playlists, the the direction and the angle that those ended up getting on the playlists were very different. But that was just a major fluke. That drives me crazy because it's not <laughs> consistent. You can't say you made it if you don't even know how or what happened. If it was an accident... Like, sure, take it, own it, and be appreciative of it. I'm not very appreciative of it, and I should be uh, with those streams because, like, those numbers are, like, very nice numbers considering I'm a nobody. But, like, I mean, it's not consistently millions of streams. But I need to be, I, I, I do need to be appreciative of it. Like this person who has 2,000 streams, be appreciative of it, but know how to take the next step, but don't beat yourself up. So... As far as the woman's playlist goes, that was a dang fluke. <laughs> the n other playlists that I've landed, though, a lot of it was the marketing. And if you are a talented prodigy, I don't care who you are. I don't care if you are the the token prodigy musical You're God. John Lennon reincarnated. Right. I don't care who you freaking are. If you have the talent without any work ethic and without any education of marketing, odds are you're not going to make it or you're not mm. going to keep succeeding and be consistent in it and something down the line, unless you figure out how to not necessarily rely on yourself, but how to have that work ethic, be appreciative of what you have and work for it. Totally. And educate yourself. I, it's just, I don't, I don't see it working because... I don't know. I struggle saying that I have a lot of talent because, I mean, people have said I'm talented, but like before I was doing well in music, better than I was at least, no one encouraged me. No one believed in me mm. except for like maybe my mom and whatever, whoever my best friends were. That's a big thing that I learned in California, that my story is not someone else's story and vice versa. And so where someone was a musical prodigy, sang the best, wrote the best, perform the best he may have been like that but I didn't get that and I shouldn't be entitled to receive that I shouldn't expect to to be discovered that way and when you when you I think that when you rely on chance and luck for your career you're gonna fail mm. you can't you can't do that because you're you're literally I think it's a cop out to actually working hard but what I ended up learning for me was I don't have that natural talent, but I really want it. And so what what it took for me was to go to another state, another city, and sit in my computer and study and learn how things worked. And I'm still freaking learning so much. Like I would never say I made it. Like it's 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 the work ethic that really that really helped me. You know, I, I'm not the most talented, but I will work really hard to figure out how to be at the caliper and level that someone wants me to be in order to, or that I need to be in order to get to the next level. So tell me the story about The Color Blue. You have, you have the song done. It's uh -huh. a great song. Thank you. But tell, tell me about the launch of The Color Blue. We were doing the photo shoot for the promotion for it, or for the uh, album cover. It just so happened that I was using the 8mm app and just like documenting the whole thing just for fun. And we, my friend had this dope uh, 67 um, uh, Corvette Stingray. And I was like, this is, I need to document this because I'm in the, this dope car and I'm with this pretty girl and no one will believe me back home. So, <laughs> um, so then we, I was looking back at the videos. I'm like, oh, this is kind of like, this is kind of cute. This yeah. could be like, this could kind of be like teaser stuff or like, it, it kind of gives more context to the song. Right. So I just decided to kind of roll with it and then start using like videos as a way to 
give context to the upcoming upcoming song to kind of get people into those that like mindset and that uh, yeah. In retrospect, like that's what that's what the freaking Smallville episode did to me. It was mm. giving me context to a song, and I think that's what the point of having music in anything in your life or in trailers, in movies, and that's because it's like it's it's playing a part in 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 what you're experiencing. So the same thing as like this breakup, it could have just been a breakup. I've seen breakups. It sucks. And then you're like, oh, this is awkward. You put music behind it. It's like, dang. Yeah. This is heavy. (laughs) You know? Yeah, totally. When you're rolling down the street and you're depressed, what do you listen to? Depressing music. Yeah. For the most part. And that's because it's putting context into what you're feeling. And so I was like, why don't I do this with my music with like the promotion of it. We do that with music videos. You know, anyways, so putting context to my songs before they're released, just, it just gets people's minds kind of like ready for it. And it gives, it gave more context to it. And it was just like a new creative outlet for me. Cause I realized beyond just being a musician, I'm, or whatever you want to say, beyond me being a, a songwriter, I also love just being creative. Yeah. You know, I do modeling and I do acting sometimes and like it, it, it doesn't matter. It really, the money's, the money's important, but like it's not always necessary because it's not about the money for me. I just love being creative. Yeah. And so now because I'm my own team, I have the freedom to be creative in my music and everything else surrounding the music, which includes the marketing. Because yeah. that's what really hypes people up in the first place. You see a trailer for a movie and you're like, dang, I want to see that movie or that is so weak. Yeah, that's because of the editing and the way they market it and the way they they present it to you. So, why wouldn't that work in the music industry, in the music field, in the in in promoting your song? Totally. And and with the creativity too. I mean, it's beyond creativity. It is still getting out to the right people because you may be somebody that has a following of five, ten, fifteen thousand, or a hundred, or two hundred, and you want to have that creativity, but you want people to see it. And so you need to know how to get it out there. And I think um, that's where the Facebook ads manager came in for me, which came in a year after I released the song. But all of a sudden I'm getting, I'm getting so much more traction on it because, um, because the people that basically I boosted the song on the ads manager and say like basically what it does is I isolate it for people who don't follow me to to see this ad. And so now I'm getting all these new followers following me and being like, oh, I never, I never heard of this. Thanks for I get on YouTube all the time. Spotify sent me here. Thanks so much for the wow. f- for the sponsor. And I'm like, like people people will send me messages saying, uh, thanks or this is so beautiful and I'm like what is so beautiful I'm like the I just saw this ad what song is it you know I'm like oh I, yeah that's right the ad but um it's such a power that you know it's such a powerful tool and so um I you know after the after the promotion um originally after those like little clips I messaged my friend Brian Bros 503 film and then Chelsea I text them one day after we shot and I was like hey do you guys want to come back tomorrow and like just film a quick little music video of us playing around and stuff to just add more context to the song. And we made just this crappy music video on my iPhone and it, it's, that was like a really big way to, to get attention for it. And that's what I used for the ads. I posted the video up and said, listen more, watch more on YouTube, Spotify, Instagram, Apple Music. And people are swiping up and talk and messaging me saying, this is great. And so it's nice because these are real people following me, telling me I love the song. And, um, and that's like the point. Yeah. That's the whole goal is for real people to like your stuff. Totally. Well, and I, I think it's interesting that you are open about the fact that you have done Facebook ads for promoting your music. Oftentimes in the creative industry, it, it almost feels like, oh, you're resorting to advertising. That must mean that your art's not good enough to stand on its own. And I think that's that kind of mentality is, 
yes, you should always approach your art as, you know, as art for the sake of art. Right. And, and but if you are making art that is connecting with people and that you honestly believe can connect with people, in some ways you almost have an obligation to try to get more people to experience that. Totally, because if you are someone that has like 600 followers on Instagram and you're like, this should connect to people organically, then if there, what, how, what is it? Seven point some billion people on the earth. Has that, what, what's the odds or what's the statistic? Something like that. You have 600 followers. So you have another something point something billion people you're robbing <laughs> from listening to your song because you are too arrogant to, I, I mean, that's a mean thing to say, but you, yeah. because you don't want to put ads up. I don't, I'm sure someone out there is expecting that they want to, they need a manager to, to get them where they want to be. And if that's the case, that manager is taking money from you. If you want a label backing you, guess what? That manager's take, or that label is taking money from you. Yeah. So how is that different than me spending money on an ad? It's my money going into my own creativity rather than right. someone else telling me how to be creative and me paying them to do that. Right. It's just another tool in the toolbox. It's, yeah. it's like saying, and they're doing oh, the I only use hammers to fix my house when sometimes you need a screwdriver. Totally. And the thing is, you're paying that label and you're paying that publish, uh, publishing company. You're paying all those people to do the exact same thing I'm doing, right. just at a grander scale. So what's the difference? I'm spending less. And it's still my money. <laughs> and it's my creativity. <laughs> I could say and do whatever I want. And it's awesome. I'm not trying. And I'm also like, for the record, I'm not like, I'm not dogging on people that have managers or wanting a manager or a label or anything. It's a tool. It's a tool. And also it is, it is completely subjective to your goal. I want to do things myself. So I know I have control of the outcome. When I rely on someone else to do anything for me, their priority is not you. Their priority is still their lives and their own priorities and their goals. You just happen to be giving them money. The more that you know how to do yourself, the more control you have over it, the less you can blame on someone else for screwing it up and the more responsible you'll be or not be. But it's on you at that point. Right. When you have a band, it's, it's a lot like owning a business. When you own a business, mm -hmm. it is 100% the owner's responsibility to develop the business, mm -hmm. to grow the business, mm -hmm. to get more people connected with the business. It mm -hmm. is not anyone else's priority. And I think in the same way, artists need to not expect that someone else is going to help them out. Well, I think the whole point of the that like fairy tale dream of like getting discovered and being on a label does that even like really exist anymore? It doesn't. That oh no, that I mean in some aspects it's not, but I also I just don't like hoping to be discovered. That's such right. a that's such a dangerous thing cuz if you're not willing to as much as you're investing in the creativity, if you're not willing to invest in the work ethic and the responsibility of the logistics of the music industry, you're either going to burn out, become a has been, never grow up, or just it's never going to happen in the first place. Yeah. I know because I've been so hard on myself about sacrificing my opportunities and my career for someone else. I need to have that work ethic and I need to make up for that. And so I'm trying to do what I can. And sometimes that means setting down the guitar or sometimes that means not writing a song today so you can study the the music industry and the, the work with it. Yeah. And understand that part so you can not be walked over, maybe making more money and actually be more consistent in the music industry than just a touring artist for a couple of years at most. Totally. I'm sorry if that offended anybody, but maybe you needed to hear it. No, I mean, but I, I think those are good things to always keep in mind hmm. is that there's a lot more that goes on being an artist than just doing the music things. And yeah. I think that's kind of the point of why... I wanted to start this podcast. Totally. It's because, and, I mean, it's in the name, is Behind the Band Podcast. Yes. Is, there's a ton of stuff that goes on behind what you see on stage yeah. or what you hear on Spotify. Yeah, and like, wouldn't you rather learn how to be strategic in where your money goes and invest in the right things and not play a million shows and get burnt out? You know, I feel like, 
I feel like I was, I went through that where like I played a million shows and it was like, maybe there's going to be a, a, a major record label at this random dive bar or, and you know, there's a lot of, we come from a small town. And so a lot of artists think, well, I can't afford to play at a venue. Maybe I'll just have my release show at a church and hopefully a major record label will know of this church and show up. Maybe. But I just don't like relying on luck and chance for my already crappy luck. <laughs> and when, you know, when I, I would rather just rely on my own work ethic and my education for, for my career. Um, putting in the time of like, of where should my money really be going? What should I really be investing to? What kind of music or I don't know what in the music industry is actually right for me. Should I be writing music? Should I be a manager? Should I be a music, uh, music director yeah. or, you know, there's so many, you know, when you say you want to work in the industry is it's, it's very broad, but that just means you make it easier, <laughs> you know, but if you want to be a touring artist or if you want to be a rock star, then maybe stop relying on chance and make yourself a rock star. And I think that comes with learning how the music industry works and and figuring out marketing and figuring out your own publicity and not relying on other people to do it because you don't have time because you're too busy writing songs. It's great you're writing songs, but I mean that's only one that's only one part of being successful as a musician, I think. So that's it for my conversation with Bo Bascoro today. Hope that's been insightful and encouraging to you. You can find him on social media at Bo Bascoro, and I highly recommend checking out his music as well. A couple of quick favors to ask. Would you just be willing to hit subscribe and leave a five-star review in Apple Podcasts? It helps us out a ton for getting people to find the show. Plus, it also just lets us know that you're appreciating what we're doing. Uh, also, if you are an artist working on new music and would love to know how to promote your music for best results, I've put together a half-hour workshop called Rock the Release. It teaches you everything you need to know to plan and promote your next single or album. Just go to evergreenrecords.com slash workshop to sign up. But for now, that's it, and we'll see you next time.